Okay, we're back again. I was sitting here yapping. Judy's over there about to choke to death. <laughs> She's okay now. I gave her a piece of candy. She works cheap. Anyway, where was I? Can't remember where I was. So, I've got this all planned out as much as I want to before I start working on these arms. One thing I added here was my little uh, copper uh, belt extensions. I like to stick these in the belt where they come out and hang. It just gives a little more action to the piece. And I like to make them out of metal because that way they won't break. I just took my uh, burning tool, let me take these out here like that, and just burnt little grooves back in underneath the belt buckle to accept these things. And uh, once the figure's all done, I'll prime these up like I've showed you, I think, before, and stick them in there and just paint them right along with the uh, the character. Okay? I went ahead and made my base. Again, uh, I don't wait till I'm finished to make a base. I like to look at the piece as it's going to appear and watch it, you know, everything come together at the same time. And by doing the base before the carving's finished, that gives you the opportunity to get the exact uh, idea of how your piece is going to look when it's done. So, using the method of making a base that I always use, I started with a nice piece of oak, hardwood, not softwood, hardwood. Your carving's worth more than softwood, use hardwood. Oak or walnut, it's great. Next layer, I uh, used a piece of quarter, quarter inch basswood that I got from uh, Heineke. And after that, I took a piece of old paneling, same stuff that's behind me here, just scrap and covered it with Bondo and then uh, put some uh, texturing material, real fine gravel over the top of that and held it down with uh, Mod Podge. And that gives me my base, which I'll paint later on. So let's just move these things out of the way. Now, this one, this segment we're gonna work on our gun. Now I gave you the profile and the pattern for the gun revolver. It looks kind of bulky and the reason it looks bulky is I overdraw my patterns a lot. That's because I carve, carve them down from the drawing. I'll carve this down quite a bit before it gets down to the final size. And I think uh, that's one of the reasons why carvers have a lot of difficulty when uh, they're cutting their blanks and I'll explain that to you. Here's Harold in Lowe's book, Carving uh, Figures in the Ozark Style, one of the basic books every carver should have, caricature carver. Anyway, here's what I'm talking about. Let me find a figure in here. I'm going to use that one. That's not a very good one. Okay, here's one here. He's not a cowboy, but it's basically the same. See this drawing here? Okay, you'll lay that, you'll take that drawing, and I was guilty of this too in the beginning. You'll take that drawing and you lay it on a piece of wood and you'll cut it out. And guess what you just did? You cut out your block on the actual figure. So when you pick up your knife and you start chipping away on the edge of that profile that you cut out, you're actually cutting away part of the figure. So when you're doing it, working out of a book or working off of a pattern like this, Make sure you allow a little excess on the outside of those lines so you can whittle that away to get down to the actual uh, shape of the figure. That's really important. It's just like allowing uh, enough wood when you're doing real fine detail like this. You want to have that wood there to use. Okay, so here's my gun blank. And that's going to go right on the side. And like I said, that looks pretty big, doesn't it? Well, it won't by the time I'm finished with it. But before I do that, get into whittling that thing, I want to explain exactly what we're whittling. We're whittling this gun. Now, I got on the uh, internet and copied off some holsters. Because, uh, like I mentioned earlier, the gun we're going to carve for this fella is, a, going to, is going to be the gun that was actually used during the period uh, that I like to carve in, which is around 18, 
1850, 1860, something like that. This is an 1851 Colt Army Revolver. It's similar to the kind that Wild Bill used. And this holster <laughs> is pretty much the same one that Wild Bill used. This was the kind of holster Wild Bill Hickok used. Okay? And I told you earlier how the holster came up to protect the, me protect the mechanism of the gun. That's there for a good reason. It protects that gun from uh, the cowboys riding through brush and stuff. And believe me, when they rode through brush, you know, you can just imagine some twig come along here and jerking that gun right out of this holster. Granted, this one has a little trigger, uh, rather hammer, hammer strap on it that you would snap down over the top. But uh, it would be best if that mechanism was hidden down inside. Okay, so this is the type of holster we're going to carve. It's going to be sort of a combination of this one here and this one up here. But, before we start that, I want to explain about the gun we're going to carve. Now, this is a single action revolver, like I said the last time. You can't pull the trigger and have the hammer go back and shoot. you got to pull it back with your thumb. And contrary to popular belief and what you see in the cowboy movies, uh, almost all the cowboys, all the gunslingers, everybody out during that period used a single action revolver. The other kind just wasn't available. Now this one has a cylinder in here, and I read a book on Wild Bill and what Wild Bill would do each day if he hadn't shot anybody or shot his gun, every morning he would go out and fire off all the chambers of his pistols to empty them out. He'd clean his gun and then reload it. That way he always had fresh fresh material in his gun so he didn't have to worry about misfires and stuff like that. Now, this is a 44 caliber uh, pistol, and there's the ball that goes inside. To load this thing, what they would do, find the loading mechanism here. Here's the little loading mechanism. Can you see that? First thing you'd do is you'd take your powder, just your little powder horn here, I'm not going to remove the cylinder, but you would remove your cylinder, take the cylinder out, take your powder, put a measure, well first thing you'd do, you'd put a cap, I'm sorry, I'll jump, jump the gun here. You'd put a cap on the end of the, the little cap nipple here, and here's a cap. This is a little cap dispenser, I'm going to get my cap out here. That's a cap right there, see that? That's what fires off the gun. You'd take your cap and you'd put it on the cap nipple. Right there. Force that on there. Okay? You only do this on five chambers, never six. Because you don't want that gun going off when you're riding around the hills or something and your horse slips and stumbles and you happen to reach down and something happens, hit your hammer or something, and your gun goes off and you shot yourself. So anyway, when you see those guys shooting six shots in the movies, forget about it. That's not the way it was. They only shot five shots because they always had their gun hammer set on an empty chamber. Put your cap on there. That's going to keep your powder from falling out. Then you'd measure out a measure of powder into your chamber. You'd take your wad. This is where the saying, he shot his wad, came from. Right there it is. That's the wad. You put that in the chamber. That's going to hold your powder in. And then you take your ball. You'll put that in there, just like that. And then you'd ram it home all the way down in there. Get that out there. I don't want that ball to get in there. And like I said, you'd have your uh, cylinder out here. And then the next thing you would do, what most of them did, was they'd take grease and they'd cover the ends of the whole uh, cylinder. And the reason they did that is when they shot that gun, they didn't want to run the risk of it setting off all the chambers at the same time. And believe me, that happened quite a bit back in the old days. And it probably happens quite a bit now, being as uh, these black powder weapons are uh, 
becoming pretty popular for uh, reenactor groups. So anyway, then he was ready to go. He had his, uh, he had five shots in his revolver. He had all his caps on. The gun was ready to go out and protect himself or keep him out of a scrape or whatever. Now that little cap there, like I mentioned, that's what sets off the powder. So let me just wind this thing around here. There are the caps up there. Neat, huh? <laughs> so, five shots. Alright, we got that down. Okay, so let me put this back in here. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to carve this weapon. Hope my little uh, history lesson wasn't too boring. When I first got this thing, my son and I went out uh, in the field out here and set up an old log and uh, loaded up this gun. Only, fortunately, I only put half the powder load in. And my son sh took a Took a good aim at the old log, sitting up there, cocked that gun, and pow! That ball went down there, hit that stump, ricocheted back, and slapped him right in the chest. I've got the ball sitting over there on my desk. I look at that every once in a while, and thank God I didn't put full load in that chamber. So anyway, you got to even black powder. you got to be careful no matter what you do when you're messing with these weapons, or any weapon for that matter. So, okay, now we're going to get started on that gun blank, which is hiding here underneath this, uh, this thing. So let me get my knife and we'll get started on it. <laughs> 